Okay, um, thank you to the organizers, Raul and Christina, for inviting me to give. This is my fourth talk uh, in, in the INI this year. Uh, so I, I you know, uh, but thank you very much. I'm having a fantastic time. It's really wonderful to be at this program uh, and this workshop. So thanks to the work program organizers and the workshop organizers. So I'm going to tell you a relatively new story uh, in a particular realization of active matter uh, in which I sort of tendentiously worked in the anti-diffusion notion, which I think is excusable. Um, that's where I am, and that asterisk means that I'm also at ICGS, uh, professor, and that's where I get support. Okay. Um, this talk is largely about one paper, which you can read on the archive. Uh, it is the PhD work of an excellent experimental student, jointly with Ajay Sood, with the uh, important roles played by Harsh Soni and Rahul Gupta, former students, one now in the tech sector and one on the faculty at IIT Mandi. But this is primarily uh, Roshan's work, and Roshan uh, will soon be applying for postdocs, so do pay attention. And we, you will see what it's about. So um, I'll introduce the topic and introduce a little bit about this particular phenomenon, which ultimately is a kind of MIPS, uh, which you heard a lot about this week. I'll talk about mixtures of motile and non-motile particles, uh, and then I'll, uh, there is the main. This is the core of the talk, and then I'll summarize. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, there are many ways to study active systems. You can study real life stuff. You can study stuff extracted from cells or purified and reassembled and reconstituted and so forth. Uh, but for many purposes, it's nice to work with artificial systems. And uh, you know, as with any living system, ensuring a food supply to the bulk of the system is a big issue. So if you're in three dimensions, Although people have very cleverly contrived, homogeneously uh, nourished three-dimensional active systems, it's much easier to do it in two dimensions or in one dimension, where you, as sort of deus ex machina, can send uh, food into the system. You've got a 2D surface, you can energize all of it homogeneously. So that, you know, that way it, it meets the sort of the defining requirement of an active system, where each constituent particle is directly getting a free energy supply which it can use and do things with. Obviously, there are, you know, I, I, this, I'm not trying to give a review of the various kinds. You can imagine doing it chemically by uh, a drop, which, uh, thanks to a chemical reaction that you have to sustain by going on feeding the chemical, makes uh, a, a tension gradient, a wettability gradient on the surface, and so moves. You can do it through the quinque instability, which is these colloids that roll. You can imagine little twisty particles with a magnetic moment sticking out of the side to which you apply an oscillating magnetic field. And they sort of do this, that, and the other. I mean, they go back and forth like this, but because they have a head-tail asymmetry, on average, they advance in one direction. Okay? Uh, the field only picks a, a third direction. It doesn't pick a direction of the plane. This is Ambarish Ghosh's work. This is the Bakalo group. Yoshikawa Uwe has done some nice theory on this. So these are, you know, the sort of more complicated and subtle systems. Our um, pet system, for many years now, uh, starting with a collaboration with Narayan and Menon uh, 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, and currently with Ajay Sood and several students over the years, uh, uses an idea. So by the way, you know, I apologize to the active materoids in the audience, but uh, with some luck, there are people who haven't heard this class of systems, about this class of systems before. So about 20 years ago, Masaki Sano came up with the idea that if you have an object like this, this is a bolt, that's the head of the bolt and that's the body of the bolt, lying on a, on a surface, uh, that's the bolt in here, and placed between two plates like this, and you vibrate this whole thing up and down, the dynamical asymmetry between the two ends will cause it to advance in one direction. And in this setting, in fact, it's, it can't even change its direction, it's, you know, it's, it's pinned, its direction is pinned and it just walks. And many nice things have been done. Ashad Kudroli has done many pretty things on this. 
For example, even if you have objects whose two ends are the same, if you pack them well enough that one end is permanently down and one is up, it's a leaning elongated object, so it distinguishes its two ends and starts walking, and this is like, you know, like a bunch of huddled, tired soldiers walking forward in one direction. Um, more generally, you can have different kinds of particles. Uh, if you have a particle whose two ends are, dis are different here, for example, uh, this end is sort of cut and this end is pointy, uh, if, then if you toss it up, then its response depends on which end comes down. And that asymmetry makes the particle advance. In this case, it turns out in a direction given by the pointy end, because the pointy end slips and the sharp end tends to get stuck. Um, if you have particles whose two ends are the same, <clears throat> then they'll move back and forth along their length. If you have a sphere, it more or less jumps up and down in place. If you give it enough time, thanks to asperities on the surface, it will do a kind of diffusion. Uh, but you know, the point is this, this motility mechanism depends on tilting, and if you tilt a sphere, it's the same sphere, right? So this guy doesn't move. Um, but it's kind of fun to see at least what the two different kinds of particles do. I may have done this in an earlier talk here, but so you know, if you have a polar rod, it walks, it clearly on long time scales will lose its way. It does rotational, something like rotational Brownian motion, but um, it, uh, it acts self-propelled. If you have particles whose head and tail is more or less the same, they tend to shuffle along their length. And the non-equilibriumness here is an unequal distribution of the kinetic energy between longitudinal and transverse movements. Okay. Uh, we won't talk about, uh, we won't talk about uh, these kinds of particles in this talk. Today's talk will have these guys and an important admixture, in fact, a majority of the round guys who kind of do nothing. And that's the system I'll be talking about. Uh, over the years, uh, this work started with a PhD student, Vijay, back in 2007, Nitin more recently, and Roshan uh, currently. Um, yeah. So, it's the reason I'm spending a little extra time on this bit is to point out that um, there are two features that distinguish this kind of active matter from things in bulk fluid. Supposing you had a swimmer, but you confine it between two plates, so it's in contact with a substrate and a wall. That's a momentum sink. These guys are also in contact with a momentum sink, but there's a very important difference, okay? These guys are walking. If you think of the microorganism, equivalent, it's like bacteria with pili. It's not flagellar motion, it's actually walking. Okay? Momentum balance and motility both involve direct dry friction with the solid substrate. Okay? So they walk. Just like us, we can't work without, walk without static friction. These guys can't walk without static friction. Okay? Um, if you have swimmers with a wall or those quinque rollers that I showed you about, Indeed, the base or the, and the base and the lid are a momentum sink, but the, the interactions and the motility are due, to are due to the fluid medium. So if you try to modulate the properties of the fluid medium, that doesn't really change the interactions between these guys. Okay? Because if you scale up the viscosity, well, that scales down the velocity. So you can't play around much. Maybe you could put other stuff in the medium, but you can't play around much with the medium to play to modulate the interaction between the particles. Here, the motility mechanism is thanks to the bare substrate. And now, if you add stuff, these moving guys talk to each other through the stuff that you've added to an extent that depends on how correlated the stuff you've added is in that background. So it is a kind of hydrodynamic interaction, but it has an important difference. Okay? The momentum transfer laterally through the beads is important, but it's in your hands. So that, um, and that, that really makes the system different. Uh, lightning review of MIPS. You know that if you have hard particles, then increasing their concentration doesn't do a whole lot if there's no other interactions. If you have dead hard particles, if you have motile hard particles, then motility together with excluded volume leads to this interesting phenomenon of a kind of condensation or phase separation, which 
uh, who the creators of which are many people in this room. I saw a nice review recently by Joachim, which uh, I recommend you. Um, and uh, basically, this is the idea. Uh, it's useful just quickly to, uh, to remind ourselves of the mechanism. So you can, if you think of this uh, a pre-existing blob, the influx into the blob is the number density times the persistent time self propelling speed. The efflux from the blob, if you have particles with a rotational diffusion time tau, is this combination in d dimensions. And if this exceeds this, you get condensation. This argument doesn't work perfectly at very long persistent times, I think, but OK. And that gives you this criterion which you saw in Aparna's talk yesterday, namely that when the Peclet number times the packing fraction is of order one or something, you should get this type of condensation. Uh, the reason I'm dwelling on this <clears throat> is that for all that effective theories of MIPS uh, are presented as just a modified phase separation, which you, you can think of as an implicit emergent attraction, it's important to keep in mind that this type of condensation is happening not because anybody is attracting anybody, not even to the extent that you would get, say, in depletion forces. It's really happening because of pushing. Okay, these guys are packing each other. Uh, so in today's talk, I'm going to tell you about a situation in which the motile species and the species that undergoes condensation are separate. You know, our friends in quantum minibody physics like to tell you about spin charge fractionation. So here I'm telling you about motility density fractionation. Uh, two important features, one this, the other is that the particles I'm talking about will not, the motile particles are elongated and their aligning interaction is very important. Okay. Um, all right. Um, the talk will feature theory in the later part, but it really is the PhD work of an experimental physics student, and I'm, I'll dwell a good deal on the experiments. Uh, it's lucky that uh, uh, computer slides don't get old. Um, so the experimental system, for those of you who don't know it, is this industrial shaker. Uh, in this particular experiment, that the viewing the sample lateral dimension is about 10 centimeters across. Uh, it vibrates. <coughs> the uh, sort of uh, RMS uh, accelerations are about 7G, quite fast and very tiny amplitude. Um, and this, we, we, we take a strictly uh, a quite two dimensional system that the viewing window is the lid and there is a base. Uh, the particles sit in here. They have enough room to tilt up and down a little bit because, you know, they need to walk. And uh, you can have different kinds of elongated particles, but uh, which are available through a source, which I can tell you about privately. Uh, in practice, it turns out that it's useful to have fairly heavy motile particles and lighter uh, background beads, uh, because they get pushed around more effectively. Um, and this, this, is, this is what the setup looks like. There's an accelerometer. Uh, and a uh, function generator. The function generator drives it. Accelerometer can measure various things, although I won't be talking about accelerations, and a camera that views it. Uh, it's the kind of experiment that a theoretician can get involved in. It doesn't involve vacuum systems, plumbing, optics, alignment, any of those things, right? So, and in fact, uh, cynics would say, why don't you just do a simulation? I will talk about simulations also presently. The, sample, the particles are big, half a, half a centimeter long, more or less, and about a millimeter in diameter. The spheres are about a millimeter in diameter also. So that's the experimental system. And, uh, and you know, the case we're interested in is the case where there's a medium present. And if you look at the motion when the medium is present, you'll see that the particle sort of plows through the medium and, uh, you know, in, there's a clear sort of asymmetry in the structure around the particle. The particle's kind of bulldozing its way through the medium, creating high density in front of it. And that will be important. Um, 
So let me tell you about sort of background earlier work before I launch into the actual uh, subject of today's talk. Uh, you, these particles, these motile particles, can create interactions with each other through flow. <coughs> if the medium is so dense that the beads are in a crystalline array, through strain. Or in a <coughs> sort of in-between densities, through just changing the density. Okay. So density, flow, and strain. So if the medium is fluid but reasonably correlated, a moving particle creates a pair of vortices. Now remember, these are not bulk swimmers. They don't create a four-roll pattern. They're on a substrate. So you get a flow like this. this the, the, the image of the flow is exaggerated by the fact that I've shown you unit vectors, not uh, vectors, but they create a flow like this. And that flow, the important thing is the distance out to which that flow is roughly in the same direction as this guy increases as you increase the density of beads. Okay? The pattern fraction of beads. So this is what I was telling you, that these guys, the degree to which they talk to each other depends on how packed the bead layer is. Okay. All right. Um, and the other part of the story, not of today's talk, but of this one, is that if you put another rod in its vicinity, again with its nose pointing like that, then the flow created by this rod aligns it. Okay? Uh, and it aligns it for the same reason that the wind aligns a weather vane. So if your two ends are a little different, if you have a flow past you, your response to that flow, because everything is anchored in the substrate, doesn't have to do with the velocity gradients, but with the velocity itself. There's no Galilean variance here. You've got a substrate. And so non-uniform drag on this object orients it. And this turns out to <coughs> give you fairly spectacular phenomena, which I feel compelled to show you, even though they're not the subject of this talk. So at packing fractions of motile particles, where the motile particles themselves, without the beads, wouldn't know about each other's presence, the induced interaction via the beads gives rise to an disorder-to-order -order transition, which is old work. At much higher bead densities, the beads themselves organize themselves into a crystal. And so now you've got motile objects moving through a crystal. Uh, the, work, the recent work by Silke Henkes looks at an elastic medium made of actual Brownian particles. Uh, and some aspects of that are related to this problem. But the reorienting by strains in the medium doesn't come into it. Recently, we looked at the coupled dynamics of motile particles in a bead medium at packing densities where the beads are crystalline. And it turns out that these particles talk to each other through the strain field like this. Um, <coughs> so they can talk to each other by just the fact they're rods means they tend to align along the extensional axis of the strain. Remember, there's not a shear flow, mm -hmm. strain flow, it's just a strain. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be indifferent to whether the head is this side or that side. At next order in gradients, they'll also respond to curvatures of the crystal planes, here, crystal lines. And that gives you a couple of dynamics. A moving particle creates a strain. A strain reorients the particles. If you patch this together, you see that this effect the strain created by one particle makes it call out to another particle in a funny kind of uh, uh, taxis. And what you get is that you get a strongly fore-aft asymmetric, a strongly non-reciprocal interaction between these two particles. The one in front doesn't know about the one behind. And the one behind can strongly sense the one in front and catches up with it. So. Uh, I, we have no idea if these interactions are used anywhere in, the, in nature, but they're rather pretty. In today's talk, I want to revisit the dense fluid medium. Uh, back then, when we wrote down a theory of the dense fluid medium, we worked in terms of the polar order. OK, so background, flow-induced interactions, all that story I'm trying to get out of. Uh, I have a vector polar order parameter. I have the number densities of beads and rods. And in principle, I have a velocity field. Let's say the bead velocity or the joint velocity doesn't really matter. And I can write down equations of motion for these. <coughs> in those equations of motion, clearly, not only will 
the flow affect the orientation and the orientation get uh, the, the polar orientation with activity drives the flow flow reorients the orientation that's the story that we that led to this state but there's also couplings to the density we in that work we mentioned them and then uh, completely ignored them at that stage we focused on flow effects so today what i want to do is to work in a medium whose only property i'll really worry about is the density okay and i will show that leads to a novel kind of active phase separation with relations to MIPS. Uh, so this weird geometry is for an accident of history, which I don't want to get into right now. Um, in the plane of bead area fraction and rod area fraction, this is an experimentally measured phase diagram. At Down here, the rods are more or less isotropic. In here, the rods align and form a flock. Here, rods and beads segregate. And after this, they don't just segregate. You can actually get structures in which the rods form essentially a single layer, a single moving layer. It's like a one-dimensional polarized active membrane. Uh, I'll show you movies which will... So the polar rods basically self-assemble into a single row. This is experiments. This is simulations with periodic boundary conditions. So that is actually a single strip. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. So in, on the previous slide, actually, yeah. two, two slides ago, um, why did you keep the unsteady term of the velocity? Oh, it's just we wrote down for completeness, we wrote it down that way. We uh, didn't really, I mean, <laughs> the point is that everything is damped here. It's not absolutely clear the velocity is more rapidly damped than the orientation, except that near onset, this, you know, the, the eigen mode is some combination of polarization and velocity, and that goes unstable. So there'll be some, that's what it was. Uh, inertia, qua inertia doesn't really play a serious role here. Yeah, so, um, you know, basically this, okay, you can't tell from this, but I'll show you a movie. You get isotropic flock, some kind of segregation of rods, and then the rods organize themselves. The important thing to note in this is I'm not changing the rod fraction. There's some 6% coverage by rods. I'm just changing the bead density. And that causes the rods to organize themselves. You get... Oh, this is not a great picture, but yeah. I'll show you a phase sequence presently. You get an interface. Um, oh, this is what I wanted to show you. So I, it's not super convincing, probably if I play around a little bit with area fractions, I can get something different. But there's, on average, a systematic circulation here, which, believe me, is not here. But um, more importantly, is here they start to cluster. And here they've already formed a single thing, which is condensing this part of the beads relatively. It's, it's a kind of active interface or active layer. You can, yes? In the absence of any rods, yeah. does the, just the bead vibrated motor yeah. layer still develop uh, over no. electricity? No, um, I mean, <coughs> I, I can tell the, you know, a vibrated layer of beads has been studied quite a lot by this group at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And to a first approximation, it's like a, a dead Brownian system. And you get a liquid, you can get a hexatic, you can get a crystal. But you don't get circulation. Not like really. I mean, not really. It doesn't look like you. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're careless and you tilt, you know, a shaken box of sand starts seeing convection rolls because of, right. you know, things that imitate hydrodynamics. But no, uh, even that doesn't happen. Um, uh, one thing that's helped us understand many of these things a lot is these mechanically detailed simulations dating from Harsh Sony's PhD work 10 years ago. Uh, this is this is not a V-check model. This is not an agent-based model. This is total mechanics, sort of killer. It has everything. It has inelasticity. It has static friction. Uh, it has a base. It has a lid. And you see, <laughs> and the advantage is it doesn't have a boundary. So it's simulations with periodic boundary conditions. So, you know, it's, it's not super clean, as you can see, but if you watch and with a sort of parent's loving eye, 
we will see this form. Okay, so it self-assembles into one line. And that simulation is as good as an experiment in the sense it's a, it's a tedious mechanical recreation of the conditions of the experiment. Okay. Uh, sorry, yeah. I assume that the bees are fluid at that high taking practice. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not assuming anything. This is just I'm letting the bees do whatever they want to do. Uh, depending on where you are in packing fraction, the condensed regions can indeed become. Well, what's the packing fraction where they become? Like, uh, 75%, yeah, I think, I roughly. You know, 76 I, I think <laughs> it's about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, in the previous, the work we did on these pairs interacting through elastic interaction, I think we had to cross about 75% to get the bead medium to be elastic. And it's cleanly, you can really see all of a sudden there's no large scale motion, but you can, if you're careful enough, you can measure the strains, you can, you can measure the displacement field in the crystalline case, the displacement field created by a moving rod. That's a separate interesting story, which I'll tell you about another time. You can also work in sort of Quasi 1D geometries, and said, imagine you take an annulus, and then imagine studying this problem for annuli of fixed width, but larger and larger circumference. Then you're doing essentially a, an effective 1D system. And there also you see, in fact, there often you see this. In fact, typically you see not one interface, but two pointing opposite, and they capture this blob, this region of beads. There is a very nice uh, work now again some years ago and again by people in this room um, in two dimensions. Oh, here's the next slide here. Um, where they take passive active mixtures and here's one example of a numerical study where you start with uh, all active here and all passive in here and after a while the actives converge into a little halo and condense and transiently stabilize a blob of uh, passive stuff. So in a sense, what we are seeing here is like a quasi 1D realization, yes sir? Ah, okay, quasi 1D realization of that phenomenon. The other in the interesting feature though is that here this state didn't last forever, it suddenly sort of blew up. This, once it forms, is pretty permanent, as far as we can tell, uh, and yeah. So what dictates the factor? So it looks, okay, we repeat the experiment, there's a reproducible partitioning of stuff between this bit and that. So it's not accident of history, initial conditions, you can probably create states which are more trapped, but there is actually some exchange of beads through, it's not an impenetrable partition. So it's a lot like vapor liquid condensation. And do the, do the rods exchange from one interface to another? So I'll, okay, uh, I'll show you, let me, uh, do I have that? Uh, okay, I, I'll have, I may have to dig up the movie. Let me show you the phase sequence anyway. So you can watch, I, the image is not wonderfully clear, but you can watch here. So here you actually get a flock. Here. Sorry, maybe I can show it again. <laughs> These are experiments. And uh, there is some exchange. And I'll tell one of the things that happens is, if there's an imbalance between the two sides, so that this whole blob is moving, that tends to free up rods from the back end. They defect, they go to the other side, and it seems to self-stabilize in this way. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering because the rods seem oriented. The rods are oriented, so, but, but uh, you know, if the, if the does move? see, the does move. once it's settled in, in this, it's like the rods are like They're this. Always oriented, right? Yeah, it's so a kind of pincer movement, right. as the so, military so people would say. Okay. So and always if it's unbalanced, this thing moves. If it moves like this, it becomes feasible, and it happens that a few defect from this side and go to the. And I'm saying they defect from this coalition to mm -hmm. the other one, and. It seems to self-stabilize. And the, the trap state is quite reproducible. The, the coexistent densities on the two sides seem roughly reproducible. I 
can't say more than that. Roshan has said he's tried it several times. But of course, the, yeah, in the end, the density here isn't, isn't utterly jammed. It's still, there's some fluctuations in here. And, and the idea is that if you make this bigger, then it will always be one. So let me, yeah, let me see what we, uh, we uh, let me show you some results from, sorry. Oh, I already showed you that. Yeah. Is finding the phase sensitive to the uh, gamma, the A omega? I'll gamma? tell you, not really. The reason is this. These are all systems which are vertically strongly confined. So even though, okay, I mean, this is detailed technicality, they are not perfect hard particles. The reason is if they were, they would have no room to move up, in which case they couldn't walk. There's a little room. And so the projected images of the spheres can be thought of as soft disks rather than hard disks because they can climb a little bit on each other. Likewise, the rods, right? If you have two rods, you can do a bit of this. Therefore, there is some role. And if you think of this as a kind of energy, then how hard you're shaking is a kind of temperature. So in a limited range, you do see this. In the Georgetown experiments, I remember they used the shaking amplitude. Maybe they had a little bit more room. In the experiment where they report liquid hexatic and crystal, I think they use the shaking amplitude as the control parameter. Here, I mean, here it more or less only sets the clock speed, and the packing fraction is the only thing. And you have two packing fractions, rods and beads. And yeah, so we can, uh, that weird geometry is not necessary. You can do this. Uh, depending on parameters, which I can't say exactly, you can, you some, these guys sometimes move so fast that they create a void behind them, like a, like a peloton of bicyclists. Okay, like a shock, um, but it doesn't have to happen. I'll show you and the trap, and I guess we can, may as well watch the movies. <laughs> yeah, sorry, the contrast is not brilliant, but you can see that, they've, that here you've got these guys moving, and they seem to move so fast. And you know, there's there's some kind of uh, frayed edge at the other side, so there is something like diffusion going on in these beads also. Um, yeah, We've been sort of uh, imprecise about what to call this moving object. I think moving active membrane is probably the best thing. All this piston and stuff is very weird. Um, anyway, uh, you can ask, you know, how big a condensate can this little layer of rods sustain? So that for that kind of thing, a simulation is useful. So here, for example, we have uh, this long dimension being 249 bead diameters, and here 498 bead diameters, same width. Uh, periodic boundary conditions along this axis, walls here, solid walls here. And you will see that it seems to be able to carry with it a very long, uh, it doesn't seem to carry, at least we don't seem to have reached any limit here. There is that weird void from moving too fast, which I'll say a little bit about. And for how small yeah. of a bead packing, a bead packing fraction, uh, you can get this? So uh, it looks like, oh, there is a threshold in phase diagram. So sorry, uh, where is the, um, around 70% somewhere, you know, so while it's still a liquid, you get, still yeah, a liquid. yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be crystal. Um, it's interesting to ask whether you can get rid of this annoying, uh, you know, shock and gap and so forth. And what you can do is you can play around with the rods to modulate their pushing force. And the way the rods walk depends on their static friction and elasticity, many things. So in a simulation, you can play around with those. And you can create states where, there's, where that, that uh, shock-like feature is absent. And if you make them move too fast, it appears. So you can watch these guys. These guys are strong propulsive force. Those are weak propulsive force. But you get them. You can also see that there's, it, it, this is not a wall. It, beads can move through. Okay, so there's some kind of exchange of stuff taking place. With it. So it's a lot like phase separation, a lot like condensation. Um, we don't... So they seem to be fairly well-defined coexistent densities, at least at low force. Uh, at high force, there is this shock. Now, the thing is, you know, the bead gas 
isn't a bulk gas with a sound speed. It's a bunch of things on a substrate. So density travels by diffusion. So you have to ask, you know, how, what is the speed scale that says you're moving too fast or too slow? I don't know, maybe it's just the elementary space step divided by the, you know, there's a shaking, which makes it take roughly one step of a certain length in one shaking time. Maybe that's the velocity scale, I don't know. Because it's, a, it's, not, it's not a fluid with sound waves on its own. So you have to wonder about that. So I'm not absolutely sure what's doing. Maybe this is what, we haven't looked hard at this. Um, so now let me do a sort of simple-minded theory. Um, bead density, rod density, V0 is the single particle utility, uh, rod polarization. I will not worry about the velocity field. I can put it in and drag in some of the physics from our old work and say that it basically renormalizes the aligning interaction. Okay, uh, the, the orientational relaxation time of the polarization. So we'll forget about it. Continuity for rods and beads. And I'm going to do the following. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to make various simplifying assumptions. One, I'm going to take the mobility. Okay, I'm going to use a reference uh, sort of uh, thermodynamic picture on top of which I'm going to add activity. Now, you can worry about how good that is, but we'll come to that in a second. So I'll imagine that in the absence of activity, this shaken, I mean, in the absence of rods, this shaken system has some kind of free energy-like description, okay? And I'll say that the currents are mobilities times chemical potential gradients in the absence of activity. And uh, I'll only assume diagonal mobilities. After all, the rods and beads get in each other's way, so this free energy functional will have some kind of coupling, let's say it's of this form, between rho and sigma, with a coefficient w. And that will give you cross couplings between the both gradients in rod bead density and rod density will produce bead currents and likewise rod currents, purely if they're coupled in a free energy. I'll then add to that the effects of motility, of activity. Two parts. One is very obvious. The rods themselves are motile. They'll have a speed scale, let's call it u naught. And therefore, if there's a region where the rods are polarized, that's a region where the rods will have a current, which is this speed times this number density times this polarization. The polarized rods push the beads. We've seen this time and again, right from when we started working on this 10 years ago for the flocking problem. So I'll declare that there is a current of beads proportional to the rod polarization and a coefficient alpha. So activity enters in three places here. Three, two, two places here. Spanish Inquisition, um, alpha and u naught. Okay, at the moment nowhere else. And uh, you can see what will happen from this. There's a question of uh, the signs of various couplings. Uh, I haven't told you about the dynamics of the polarization. Uh, so before I do that, just to remind you, I choose a sort of reference thermodynamic picture on top of which to add activity because of this work of Olafsson and Urbach which suggests that a free energy basis description is okay in the absence of motility. Uh, anyway, the polar order parameter, on general symmetry grounds, it'll have a dynamics where the polarization can relax. Maybe if interactions get strong enough, the polarization wants to align, A will change sign, and then you need this to saturate. Uh, the polarization responds to gradients in density. How does it respond? I mean, you could think of it as just symmetry allowed couplings between the two, but uh, what I'll say is that the rod is tapered. And so, you know, left to itself, if you presented it with a bead density profile, chances are it'll, you'll find it with its bead, with its nose, narrow nose in the dense region and its tail, fat tail, in the low density region. So it likes to point towards high bead density, okay? So the coefficient A, capital A, is positive. Um, I won't worry about the aligned phase. Let's forget about the BP dot P. I'll just relax P to say that it's therefore of this form. And I'll stick that into these equations, right? Which will lead to effective coupled conservation laws for rho and sigma in which the fact that polarization, motile polarization creates a density gradient in front of it 
and, motile, and those motile rods like to point towards high density, that positive feedback gives you a potential for the diffusivity of the beads to be reduced. It also introduces other couplings all over the map. One of the interesting, so first this, rods like to create a density, rod, rod movement creates a density gradient ahead of it, high density ahead of it, and rod likes to point towards high density, is the fundamental instability that produces rod, uh, segregation between high and low bead density with rods sitting at the interface. Um, the off diagonal couplings are also interesting. If you look, uh, by the way, they, the, if you take this problem and look at the diffusive instability, the anti-diffusion, uh, the eigen mode is mostly density. It's bead rich, bead poor segregation. Now, as for the off diagonal terms, um, here. actually, before I go there, um, you can ask, okay, I'm clearly I'm trying to write down some conheliard like description. I have about 10 minutes. I'll stop in about three or four. Um, what about next order and gradients? What about the surface tension term? So, you know, if you take this picture seriously and write down the polarization dynamics, including orientational elasticity for the polarization, and then invert in Fourier space, this guy gives you a tension term, provided activity is also present. So it may be, so what does it mean? You've got this interface, if you curve it, rod elasticity straightens it out. Okay, so it's there. This is a problem actually, because anyway, so act active pushing mimics attraction, destabilizes uniform density, and seems to create a positive tension as well. This model doesn't have any other mechanics in it, it just has compositions, so there's only fluxes, but this is, and this is all super simplified description. Um, the other point I want to win, let, now let's go back to our equations of motion and look at the off diagonal terms. How does rho couple to sigma and how does sigma couple to rho? d rho sigma is the bead mobility times this cross interaction parameter. d sigma rho is the rod mobility times the cross interaction parameter. So rods are long compared to beads, so you would expect the rod mobility is small compared to the bead mobility. In that case, that means that this guy is small compared to that guy. And you can imagine, therefore, that by increasing the bead fraction, this term can change sign while this term doesn't. So this offers one natural path to uh, non reciprocal Kahn-Hilliard kinds of, couple Kahn-Hilliard kinds of descriptions. Okay? Right? Um, so you can take those equations. We haven't done anything beyond linear stability analysis. We just looked at the modes, and you can look at the, the nature of the onset starting from an isotropic phase or starting from a polarized phase. There are differences of detail. Clearly, in the polarized phase, everything will be moving uh, anyway. Okay? Uh, let's try to understand how. Okay, so that's the end of the sort of field, you know, baby field theory for this problem. Um, the other thing we can do is ask, supposing you have a, a pre-given self-assembled active membrane pushing these guys, how much can it push? So you can write down number conservation for the beads, and you can declare that this little edge here is a moving delta function with force F, and you can say that there's drag on the beads, and that there is some kind of bead pressure. Okay, there's the vibration making them move around. So the beads have some kind of equation of state, which for the muir is probably a hard sphere equation of state, a confined planar confined hard sphere equation of state. Uh, this sort of problem has also been studied in the context of motile things in, in glassy or nearly glassy systems by uh, Mullen Rao and company. Now this problem, we I won't solve the phase separation problem. I'll declare that for x going to minus infinity or plus infinity. Sorry. Uh, way over there, okay, so this is turned around. Basically, on one side, I'll declare there's a density rho naught, I've, and that's the reference density, and I've got this moving front, and I'll ask, can I calculate the density profile? So if I take the equations I wrote down and co-move with a rigidly moving solution, I get this sort of mess, uh, so which gives me a condition for the density jump in terms of the jump in the pressure gradient across this guy. I can integrate uh, the density equation from minus infinity to x with these boundary conditions and get 
this equation to the density, I can integrate across the delta function and get the pressure jump. If I pretend that the del pi over del rho uh, on the left is whatever it is at the reference density, I'll get a constant density. So if the front is moving this way, I'll get a constant density behind it, which is just the reference density. And if I assume that pi prime of rho on the other side is everywhere is equal to the value just after the jump, I'll get an exponential decay profile with a length that diverges as pi prime of rho goes to infinity. Okay, so the more densely packed it is, the longer the decay length. So basically, it looks like I can get a very, very, very large condensate. Remember, there's no inertia here. Just nudge, 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 and you can move a lot of the stuff along. Okay, so the extent of the bead rich region seems to be limited only by its compressional steadiness. Okay, so that's the end of my talk, and I have five minutes for questions. Uh, there are various things which we don't understand. I gave you equations with a diffusive instability. I should see a spinodal pattern. I always see only one interface and two <coughs> domains, no matter what I do. We've played around a lot. We don't understand, but we haven't played around with changing parameters like by hand changing the rod orientational diffusivity. There are many other possibilities. So, you know, a detailed theory is in progress. It's an optimistic <coughs> statement. One of the things we don't understand is where is spinodal decomposition. And I think it is Mike last year or earlier this year who asked me where it was. And this is Roshan's PhD work. You can read about it. And thank you. A couple of short questions. Yeah. Uh, the movie you showed of yeah. beads yeah. with shocks. It reminds me of the slugs that you get in a in public. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I figured it would. I don't know. Which ha only happens after a critical Reynolds model. Right. Is, is there a critical? I mean, this is the, the important control parameter is just the the, refer the background bead packing density. Yeah. You can also change the propulsive force if you want and play around with it. But the phenomenon is probably a, a lot simpler than turbulent slugs. Kiran, would you go back to your linearized equations for yes. just a moment? So, uh, not this one. The, yeah, this one. Yeah. Why is the direct diffusion coefficient in rods mm. having this anti-diffusion thing with respect it to... It doesn't. I've, I've written it... This is a matrix, right? I've just written the row term here and the sigma term here. Yeah, but that's... Yeah, right, right. The, the so why does it have this? Huh? To lower the diffusion coefficient of the single guy? No, so I'm saying that the, 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 the couplings between the two... Remember... Okay, um... So this is just motile, I, I got rods. Supposing I didn't have beads. I just had rods, rod polarization and rod density. The rod density has, the rod polarization has a preference about which way to point mm -hmm. with respect to rod density gradients. Mm -hmm. So this whole story can be told even <laughs> there. I don't have such a clear idea which way the rods like to point with respect to rod density. Because so I so I mean, if I just wrote a couple of theory only of density and polarization, for the rods I get some effects that are similar. You know, as far as I understand, this is some kind of interface theory that you construct, but at the end you said that the interface width diverges, so I'm a bit worried. The interface width doesn't diverge. The bead, the, 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 how, the, the size of the condensed Prime. bead frag chunk uh, can be the, yeah, okay. the interface width doesn't diverge. Yeah. Yeah. We've also done some small scale measurements uh, of whatever interface fluctuations we could detect, and over sort of Again, parents loving I, a range of wave vectors. There's actually a 1 over Q squared for the height variance. But it's a very small range. So I don't know. Yes. How long of an interface can you know, continue? No, because presumably if the interface are very long, then the it, polar uh, particles might not. I mean, you saw the 2D, in the 2D things, at least, especially in the simulations where boundaries aren't an issue, you can get something pretty much macroscopic. Um, where's the movie? It's probably here. I mean, they can more or less span the system. They're a little crappy, uh, but uh, we haven't tried very hard to optimize. But on average, they're there. I mean, remember, this is periodic, so it's a line going across the box. So it can be... I don't know that there is, that there is an instability. I mean, I don't know either way, really. Yeah. Okay, so I will...
Stopp. Welche ist wieder? Stark.